If you knew what I have in front of me, you would be in shock. Just a moment. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Beautiful. This, yes. This is absolutely this is absolutely insane. This is perverted. Um, Katarina, is it okay? I since I have so many lenses that are made in Canada. I would not mind talking about uh, uh, Walter Mandler. Walter Mandler was the chief optical designer for Leica uh -huh. for many, many, many years. And, and uh, because Leica, Leitz, Wetzler, they needed, um, for various reasons after the war, they needed to, to do something that no one had done. They, they needed to do um, a factory or works outside of Germany because Germany, as you know, was bombed absolutely to smithereens after the war, I mean, in the war. And after the war, there was only, you know, the only thing they needed to do was to build up everything again. Okay. And no one really had could, could afford to buy a Leica in mm. Germany. Uh -huh. mm. So what did they do? Well, they um, they established a, a factory or Leica works in, in Midland, Ontario, in, in Canada. And that was very successful because, of course, this catered for the American market. And the Americans, they were very affluent. They could buy anything after the war. And, <laughs> yes, you know, they still can. Um, and, uh, or very few of them. But anyway, they, they built up this factory and the optical designer from Leitz, Wetzler, Dr. Walter Mandler, he was sent over for on loan <laughs> on loan mm -hmm. in, in Canada to help them you know build up the, the optical facilities and things like that. But he stayed on. He stayed on for more than half a century and uh, so he, he made his whole career in Canada and all the, all the important lenses from Leica are actually designed by him. And that is why you find so many lenses that says Canada, <laughs> Canada. And uh, one of his most famous designs is, of course, indeed, the Noctilux. And, um, but from the Noctilux, before the Noctilux, you, know, you had, he also designed the, the Sumicron 90. Uh, which, you know, was heavy and hefty. You can kill a horse with this one. Uh, and, but it was, it was the pendant, of course, to the, to the 50 millimeter Sumiko, which was also probably by him. This is, this is um, a, a dual range, you know. And um, all these designs were by him. And, he also designed the new, look, here's an eighth element, Lights Canada. Mm -hmm. And of course he did the Tele El Marit, it's also Lights Canada. They were all made in Canada, these lenses. And of course he also made the El Marit 135. This, this one is very, very early. This is from the absolute very first batch of this, these lenses. It's perfect. It's, it's wonderful. Um, and the, the Sumicron 90 and the El Marit 135, they are, they are siblings. I mean, they, 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 they go very much out of the same format, although the optical formula of the, uh, the, the El Marit is slightly different. Of course, this is this is a pure Gauss design, 
double Gauss design than semiclone, all the semiclones were. And this was this was Walter Mandler's specialty. He he specialized in the the optical formula that was uh, that is referred to as the double Gauss. And um, Gauss was a mathematician in the 19th century, optical designer, and he was the guy who made lenses like that. You know, they were they were sort of uh, uh, um, they were sort of uh, symmetrical. But yeah, and you know, I mean, this is the history. Everyone knows about that. Um, as the uh, you're recording, aren't you? Sure. Because I'm, I'm in the thick of it now, and you can't stop me, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> so, uh, but of course, uh, the Leica factories or the Leica concept, the whole Leica thing, came into big trouble in the 1970s because of the rise of the single lens reflex cameras like the Nikon F and and Leica did do a Leica flex in the 1960s but it was already as it came out it was it was a wonderful camera brilliant of course but it was already old fashioned Nikon did it better and although you you know you could as you know, with the Leica it says and that's it, and with the Nikon it says mm -hmm. <laughs> But you know, in, in in the in the in the in the professional photographic scene, I mean, in the press photographer scene, they didn't mind the noise. The only place they minded noise was in in uh, in American uh, courts, courtrooms. And they stipulated that um, the noise of a camera shall not be louder than that of a Leica rangefinder camera. So that's okay, fine. But I mean, there is a limit to how many Leicas you need in an American courtroom. So <laughs> for all the rest, of course, it was crash, 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 crash everywhere. And and you know, with the Leica, nothing. Uh, it whiffs along, and that's it, and uh, and no one asks anything. And even even the modern digital Leicas, except for the new M10P, um, are are louder than the classic M camera. Anyway, so they were in deep trouble, and they were writing red uh, in their uh, economic. Um, it was uh, going down, and. At some point, they even stopped uh, making the Leica M camera in Wetzlar. They were doing the M4, and all of a sudden, there was no more M4. And what did they do? Well, in Canada, they didn't want to take no for an answer. So they kept working and working and working, and people like Walter Mandler was one of the forefront people there, and they saved the Leica M camera. Huh? So in 1977, I think, uh, they came out with the Leica M4 II. Mm -hmm. The four with a two. And uh, that saved the M camera. And it says lights, and it said Canada. <laughs> And, and it was all Canada, and um, and then they, you know, they were floating again. Eh? And uh, in 1980 came the M4P. I guess the P was for professional. You know, the, the M42 and the M4P did not have a self timer. <laughs> did not have a self timer. Self timers was considered to be for amateurs. Yeah, so the P was no self timer. Eh? We can't have these amateurs lurking around here. Of course, it was more. I mean, when you see nowadays, if you were realistic, it's only amateurs who can afford it that buy Leica M cameras. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so they saved the Leica M camera, and in 1980. 
the with the M4P came a set of new lenses. They came with a new 21 millimeter El Marit 2.8. Wonderful. It came with a new El Marit 28. Wonderful. It came with uh, um, a new Sumicron 35. Yeah. This, uh, this little jewel here. This, it, which is referred to as the so-called king of bouquet. I don't know really why, but it has a it has a wonderful bouquet, um, and it and of course the 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 Sumilux 1.4, the most compact uh, 1.435 lens in the world. It's mm -hmm. fantastic, and was was uh, you know was still kept up, and but the new thing was in 1980 came also. The Noctilux in 1.0, yeah, or that came actually a little bit, a few years before actually, sorry, but this thing came along and that was absolutely new and this, this is the Sumilux 75 and 75 was a focal length that Leica had had in, in the 1930s, huh? the, the Hector 7.3 centimeters, 1.9, and, and very nice portrait lens. So they they did a reiteration on that idea, and of course, these two lenses are extremely closely related. They have the almost same optical formula: the Noctilux 1.0 and the the Sumilux 1.4. And this is all thanks to Dr. Walter Mandler. <laughs> yes. Now, for I don't know for political reasons, or I don't know really. I, I I'm not going to delve into that because I don't know anything. So it's pure speculation. But at some point, the this very proudly, slightly, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, it's a lot of Canada here. Lights Canada, Canada. Fine. All of a sudden. It only says lights. <laughs> and this lens is from 1976. Mm -hmm. No, it's 86, 1986. This specimen. And it only says lights. But, of course, it is still made in Canada. Yeah? Um, and... Um, yeah, and so, so, so this... More and more, they, they slightly boil down the Canada fever. And sadly enough, in 1990, Leitz and Wetzlar decided that they would sell the factory in Midland, in Ontario. And uh, by that time, um, Mandler was retired. And uh, I know that this broke the heart of very many people. I, I had a Facebook friend once that, that worked for Lights Camera, and I said, all of a sudden, we were told that this was not going to go on anymore. It, it broke my heart. So this is why I want to say nice things about Lights Canada. <laughs> <laughs> it may, it might be slightly, you know, over the top, and it's none of my business. But we can all speculate, and we can all have feelings, and we can all have sympathies. And uh, had it not been for Lights Canada, we would not have had Lights Metzler either. And uh, now we have Lights Metzler, of course. And it's back to the to, to new wonderful headquarters, da, 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 da. And, and I'm I'm looking forward to show you show you around in, in Wetzlar <laughs> when when the pandemic is over, we will meet. But uh, Lights Wetzlar, of course, have done wonderful things all the time, and of course, without Lights Wetzlar, there would not have been Lights Canada either. And not only that, but it would not have been Lights Portugal. Mm -hmm. 
because in Portugal, in north of Porto, in from Licao, there there are lights works and they make all the the hard stuff, the you know the the, the bodies, um, things for the you know anything that is out of metal is comes from 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 Licao, and um, it's all much of the things are are. Uh, put together in family call. And uh, this is also, of course, something that the world, it doesn't hurt to know these things, but you don't know unless you know or unless you ask. And um, the, the factory in family call in Portugal came about in a time when, when Portugal had a lot of qualified people and they needed this type of work in the in the 1970s 80s whatever after the after the carnation revolution you know in in 19 uh, in 1974 and uh, and that's why all these wonderful things are made in portugal and it's, it still says nights <laughs> mm. yeah yeah but that's fine it's, but but we know we know, and of course nowadays, when you think of it, you and I are extremely privileged people, and we really ought to be extremely grateful that we can be so privileged, because we can sit here in a world which is you know tumbling, and we can. We can talk about we can talk about all these niceties, you know. These, these uh, people don't, you know. They would think we are crazy. I mean, pro- probably are. But you know, when you think of this piece of glass here, which was patented, patented American had about American patent in 1991. It was the new Simulus that took over from a design that came about in 1960, yeah? and this was 30 years later, mm. and the Similex 35 had gone on for all those years, and it was fantastic, and it still is. It's very soft on full opening, but that's fine. I mean, the, the, the women like that um, for, for several reasons. Um, and, and But then they, you know, as you know, the, the first Noctilux eh, of, of 1966, which had a reiteration again now in, in a new Noctilux. Everyone is talking. Oh, uh, had a spherical lens elements. This also had a spherical lens elements, two of them, and it was so expensive to make because they were all grinded individually, literally by hand, and they they, they did not make any money on this lens. Eh? But now this thing. This piece of glass, and I, I read on the internet just now that um, the the present copies are owned by collectors. I know, fine. <laughs> I bought this lens in '93. I was not a collector by then, but I paid an arm and a leg and the white out of your eyes. Um, and and I still have it, and I will never part with it. But this is one of those things that we. Are privileged to to be surrounded with. I mean, they, they made a, about a thousand copies of this. No one knows really for sure how many, but it was too expensive, and they did not earn any money on it. But I mean, they they taught, they it was so expensive, but there is a there is a limit to what you can charge because you after all you have to sell some things that you have have made for sale, and. Um, but this is now, people are demanding 25,000 euros for this thing. And I, I, I find that very sad because it only limits the market now for, for, for a Sumilux double aspherical to the people with far too much money because uh, and, and it, you know it has no room for 
us, normal, non-wealthy uh, people, the, the, co the collector's market is going absolutely through the roof, and it's, I think it's a bubble. It's a little bit like the, like the real estate market in places. It's, it's you know, and, and the stock market, for that matter. Uh, the, these things are now too expensive. So who is buying them? Well, Russian oligarchs. Eh? <laughs> that's, that's, that's the normal, normal person to blame for all these things. But not only this, this stimulus, but also this wonderful eighth element, Sumigron, eh? the very famous from 1958, Walter Mandler. And, and these things now, I mean, five, six years ago, you could get them for, let's say, 1500 whatever. And I paid a little bit more, but not horrendously much more. And now these things are, you know, they, they demand three and a half to four and a half, five thousand for these things. And they're not even that rare. It's just, it's absolutely ridiculous. And it's such a pity because these things, they are, they're not modern, but they're wonderful tools, you see? They, they, as you know, we make wonderful pictures with them. And it should be for, for people like you and me, you know? It's, this, this is not, this is not a speculation object. This should be open for everyone. And it should be open for people like that really are thankful. People like me who were young and teenagers in the 1960s when they were made. You know. And this, this, is, this is what I really, I burn for these questions. And I, you know, that, that's why I'm sitting here with, with very few modern lenses. One of the, very few modern lenses I have is the Super Elmar 21. And the, as you can see, this is on a digital Leica. Mm -hmm. And it's a fantastic lens, very sharp, it's very aesthetical, it's clean, totally, you know, spank spank. But of course, the Super Angulon, just a moment, just a moment. The Super Angulon. It's also a very nice lens. This is a very early one, early 3.4 from 1963, I believe. And it's fantastic. But this is not all your horses. This is not a Leica design. Did you know that? This is a Schneider Kreuznach. You know, the Super Angulon is, is, is very famous from the from the from te technical cameras the, the big film format cameras from the Cinar, you know the super angulon blah 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 lots of uh, lots of, of, of degrees here but of course Leica as they said we did not uh, do a 21 millimeter back in the in the 1950s mm -hmm. and we needed a 21 millimeter because everyone else had them. So we had a very nice, very nice uh, cooperation with Schneider in Kreuznach for the formula of the Super Angulo 21. And this is how it came about, the Super Angulo. And that, and it, first it came in F4.0. And then they, they, they you know, made, made it half a step quicker. 3.4 and this is this is the pre-stream for the super elmar because that has also 3.421 so that's that's they're back to the roots eh? but this is of course a totally normal um, what do you call it retro focal optical design because it does not come into the camera body this lens you cannot use with a Leica M5 because it will stick, you know, it will crash with the light meter. Um, but this is a, a the Super Angulon is a, is a totally symmetric design, which means it has no aberrations. It's absolutely straight. 
And this this is very, very, very good. And I don't think it has aberrations either. But, you know, this is a design from the 50s. Huh? Mm -hmm. And this is a design from the 90s. Or the 2000s, actually. And that's Peter Carver. The big, big, big new wizard of Oz, of Wetzlar. But that's a different story. 